Thank you. This presentation is a uh, part of a work in progress, sprung from a dialogue between myself, a prehistoric archaeologist, and Michi Amari, a historian. So, two different points of view, um, with the aim of investigating different breads, variety of breads, and the different processing modes of these breads in the ancient Near East and trying to identify possible uh, changes in time or space in bread production. Uh, we do this by using archaeological, ethnographic and epigraphic data, um, not only limited to the Near East, but also to regions that have been linked with the Near East um, historically. Okay, so we start um, with... Sorry, I just have to understand how this works. Oh, there, there, I have to look over here. I thought, okay. Um, bread. Okay, bread in the Near East, like in Europe as well, is obviously the main staple food. Um, basically because bread is made with cereals. Cereals are the most cultivated plant in the Near East, of course. But the importance of bread as the main food is also suggested and indicated by um, ancient terminology. So we have, for example, in a cave in Sumerian, the pictogram for bread. Oops, I wanted to use this. The pictogram for bread and the one for to eat are the same. Say likewise in a cave, a column indicates bread, but it also indicates the term to eat. Um, furthermore, symbolically, the term used to indicate a guest is Bel uh, Akim, the Lord of eating, the Lord of bread. So you have this equivalence between bread and eating, uh, which is further suggested in by the Council of Wisdom, where it is said that when you receive a guest, you have to give the guest bread to eat and beer to drink. Beer, again, of course, is made from cereals. Um, the symbolic value of bread is also expressed in other kinds of texts. For example, in literary texts, uh, like in the case of the Epic of uh, Gilgamesh, where Enkidu, that is uh, initially a beastly-like um, hero, uh, is introduced to civilization by two elements. One is sex and the other is uh, being taught how to eat. And being taught how to eat again means eating bread and uh, drinking beer. Um, other interesting texts are from uh, later on in the 3rd millennium BC legal transactions, so texts that um, indicate the selling and buying of uh, real estates. We have the buyer of the real estate who is meant to give a banquet, uh, offering food to the people that have been involved in the transaction, and the food that he gives, he offers, is various kinds of food, but amongst these, bread. Even more strongly, the symbolism of bread goes on in the second millennium legal transactions, in which we have, at that point, uh, no more banquet. This is in text from Mari Emar and Avalach. Um, the transaction is validated by two symbolic actions, one of which is the breaking of bread, and the other is the anointing of the table. Okay, so when do we have uh, the first indications of the processing, the presence of bread in the ancient Near East. We go backwards in time and um, indirect but clear indications of the appearance of bread or bread-like products uh, can be dated to the Natufian period. So we are 12,000 BC. Uh, the Natufian is a culture that develops in the Levant. And in all the different sites, we have great quantities of grinding materials, so grinding stones, pestles, mortars, that clearly indicate the production of flour. Of course, flour can be of different kinds of cereals, and here, so we go into ingredients. Um, with the flour, they make bread or bread-like, cake-like products. Okay. Um, I was saying that. Um, Cereals out of which you make bread can vary. This uh, variety in the cereals is also confirmed by the ancient texts, where 
um, it is clearly mentioned that flowers can be of different kinds, that um, the difference can be related to the kind of cereal used. And for example, we have a majority of cases in which barley is used to make flour in southern Mesopotamia, whereas in the northern Mesopotamia or even Anatolia, we have emmer wheat. Um, or flour can vary according to the, its fineness, uh, thus more or less ground. Um, there are texts in which bread is listed and counted. Uh, in this case we have a text from uh, the Paris of Mari, so dated to the 1800 BC, um, in which um, they count the bread that goes to the table of the king. And the bread is counted according to the number of liters used, of liters of cereal that are used to make the bread. Um, bread can also vary according to other elements. For example, bread can be leavened or unleavened. Um, again, the texts tell us about this difference. So we have, again in the case of Mari, a text in which uh, bread for the table of the king is described and in which it is clearly said that the amount of unleavened bread that reaches the table of the king is much higher than the amount of the leavened bread used in a ratio that is approximately 6 to 1. Sorry, you do not see the numbers, but um, it is about 80 liters of unleavened uh, bread reaching the table of the king. Um, then, of course, you have the leavened bread. The leavened bread uh, can be obtained uh, either by the same dough with which you make unleavened bread without adding any uh, ingredients, any yeasts, or you can add yeast, of course. Um, and the leavening, the rising of the bread, is due to the gluten that is uh, present in the proteins of the wheat, um, which form an elastic matter when the, the flour is mixed with water uh, that traps the carbon dioxide that is formed when fermentation of the dough starts. So basically, you can obtain leavened bread, as I was saying, by adding a yeast that helps the beginning of the fermentation or by leaving the dough in a certain temperature and condition in which, with time, the leavening would start. Um, now, discussions upon the beginning of leavened bread production are still rather uh, uncertain, uh, but we wanted to point out here that some of the products that are used as yeasts um, were present already by early times. For example, Vicervilia and Cicera lietinum are uh, commonly found in botanical remains uh, throughout Neolithic times, Neolithic sites in the Near East. Um, Okay, then the next important element, uh, you need to bake bread, of course. Once the ingredients are there, you prepared the dough, you bake it. How do you bake it? And can you obtain different kinds of breads according to the way in which you bake them or to the kind of fire installation that you use? Um, again, we go back to texts. Um, first of all, an interesting point to, um, to mention is the fact that the... the um, of baking bread is clearly separated in the language, in the um, Akkadian language, to that of just normal generic cooking. So you have uh, epum that is used for the baking of bread as opposed to the bashanum, uh, which is the generic word for cooking uh, food. So it is really something that is separate from the rest of all the cooking activities. Um, Fire installations. Uh, texts um, give a generic term, kine, Sumerian, which is kinuru in Akkadian, which is the generic term for oven, used for very, various kinds of food. Whereas, uh, very commonly, there is another term used is tinuru, which is the oven expressly used only solely for bread, um, bread, bread, bread processing, bread baking, and only for unleavened bread. Um, we will get back to this in uh, a minute. Um, because we wanted to point out here uh, the old Babylonian recipe book that has been uh, interpreted by Jean Baudet, um, which is composed by three tablets, 
um, of the Yale Oriental Series, 25-26-27, in which proper recipes, meat, pigeon uh, recipes are given. And this one in particular is very interesting because next to the meat, next to the pigeon, uh, bread is also prepared to be eaten together with this meat. And uh, it is very uh, described in detail, um, saying that from the same dough, this means the same ingredients, two kinds of bread are then baked and eaten in the same recipe. What uh, the cook has to do is uh, separate, to divide into the dough, one piece would then be uh, baked in the tea noodle, so it will become a flat bread, whereas the other half will be put in a pot. The pot is then sat on top of the tea noodle and put to bake uh, with a slower baking, which will make it even. So in the same dish we have, and made out of exactly the same ingredients in two different processing manners, coming up to two different kinds of bread. There are many issues that still remain open. We do not know if even and uneven bread have different meanings, if they are used in different contexts. These are all issues that, questions that come and raise uh, from this study, which we haven't really given an answer yet. Um, okay, the, the tinuru. The tinuru is most clearly the tanur, tandur, that is commonly used today as well in the Near East. Um, it has a core, um, an opening at the top, sorry, there, there's an opening, which is this one. This is used for the ashes and for uh, air. Um, and you can, let me go forward, there. The bread is cooked on the sides, on the interior, the fire is lit inside the tanur, and then the bread is stuck to the sides of it. And this is the tinur that produces the black bread, commonly used today in just about every household and township in Turkey and Syria. Um, the tanur can either be left with its core visible, like in this case, or it can have a structure with that sided, which is normally also used as a table for working in the dough and then putting the bread on top of it. Um, Archaeologically, you will find this kind of tanur mostly indoors, whereas when you have bread production outdoors, you normally have this one. Um, again, archaeology. We uh, identify, we were able to identify the presence of tanurs in Noro in, um, throughout Mesopotamia and Anatolia, Near East in general, in uh, middle, early, middle, and late bronze. Uh, I mean, starting from the, uh, the Bronze Age. Uh, here you have uh, the kitchen in a Kalte, in Mombaka, where you have the Tandir, the Tinoru, the core, next to a rectangular hearth. Okay, so in the kitchen you have the two uh, kind of fire installations. Very interesting instead is the fact that we do not have these kinds of ovens in prehistoric sites. So no tandirs, tinuros in Neolithic sites, no tandirs in early middle Calcolithic. We start uh, seeing them being mentioned at the very end of the late Calcolithic period, late Calcolithic 5, this would be around 3300 BC. But from our point of view, we think that also these need to be looked into because the definition that is given to these Tandirs or ovens is never very precise, and we believe they might not be Tandirs yet. Um, why do we say this? Because the other kind of fire installation that we have very commonly in prehistoric sites is this domed oven. The domed oven is very familiar to us, it's the pizza oven, we have it today just about everywhere in the Mediterranean. Uh, it has a single chamber within which we have the fire and the bread to uh, bake. The bread can be both unleavened bread or leavened bread. And when it is leavened, it can either be just sat in the fire, I mean, I'm sorry, in the oven, or bread molds can be used. Um, these ovens are very common, as I was saying, in prehistoric sites. You see them all over the place. Here is Anatolia 
in the Neolithic, Ceramic Neolithic period, uh, Upper Mesopotamia or Babahia, then you have them in Halaf period, uh, you have them in uh, Ubaid, both in Anatolia and in Mesopotamia, and they are they can be indoors or outdoors in courtyards. Um, now, why we're we saying that uh, the definition of these ovens has to be very precise, because when you look at these, they might be taken as tanurs, uh, but there is a very important difference between the two kinds of ovens, that is in the floor of the oven. The domed oven um, has a preparation of its floor, because the floor is the place in which you put the bread or other food to be cooked, and so it is generally plastered, and at times it has a stone or shirt preparation that helps to retain the heat. In the case of the tandir tinuru, this is never so, because the tanur works on its sides. So the base, which is always there when you are excavating, is the solution to the identification. Um, domed, oven, domed ovens are, as I was saying, frequent and prehistoric sites, but they do continue to be used, and so there is a double production that is going on in historical period with uh, domed ovens and tanurs. Uh, this is an interesting case, it is in Tenubaka, Lake Bronze Age, where we have a very large domed oven, nearly 5 meters in diameter, um, built inside a single a structure which is probably that's a bakery or something of the sort. The text that describes the structure is interesting because it is telling us that it, this bakery is linked to a domestic dwelling that is next to it, so probably owned by the same person that owns the house. Um, then, of course, the last kind of fire installation, the hearth. This is the most frequent, it is all over the place since ever, more or less. Um, the hearth can also be used to bake bread. Uh, it is used for unleavened bread nowadays, very commonly. Today they normally use a metal griddle on top of it and put the thin bread over it to bake. Uh, but we have found interesting um, epigraphic and ethnographic descriptions that tell us that the hearth can also be used to bake leavened bread. Uh, this is an interesting text um, which says that uh, a young man, after having prepared the dough, he will, that means he would grind one liter of barley, throw the bread on the brick that has been first heated in the fire, and it would then, the bread would cook, would bake on this brick. Uh, this is an ethnographic case from Serbia, uh, but it is commonly known throughout the Balkans, where a slab, a round slab of clay is put to heat in the fire, it is then removed by the, uh, from the fire, and dough is set on it to be baked. Um, it, this can also be done with a pot, uh, the dough is put inside the pot that has been heated in the fire, the pot is then covered, and in this way you get leavened bread. Um, a similar uh, practice or similar process for bread baking is known from ancient Egypt. Uh, it is illustrated in the tomb of tea, where you see the bread molds, they are ceramic vessels, here they are. Um, they are put to heat, and it is described in the hieroglyphics here, they are put to heat on a fire. Once they have been heated, they are removed. The dough is poured into the vessels. They are covered, and then, in this way, you, you obtain the heated bread. Um, this is a rather well-known case, and some scholars have used this to uh, um, hypothesize that the Uruk Bevadrum bowls dated to 3300 BC, mass series uh, production, might have been used as bread molds as well. We believe that this uh, issue still needs a little bit of thinking and data to be tackled, but we want to um, hypothesize <coughs> that uh, there might be other vessels in ancient Near East that might have functioned as bread molds as well. These are the ethnographic cases, these are the bread molds known from Serbia. We see there are tray-like vessels uh, that very interestingly at times have some incisions inside them. And uh, these are the uh, prehistoric vessels that are known, very typical of um, 
non effect, ceramic non effect period, they date it to the 7.9 MBC, and they are the so called Hasuna Haskin trays. They have a very wide distribution throughout Upper Mesopotamia, Levant, and Eastern Anatolia, and they're characterized by these incisions inside them that can be statistically very varied, uh, sorry, very varied, like this, where you see they can change very much. Um, the, the stylistic difference between these incisions might have a social, maybe kinship uh, role, which we are looking into at the moment. We are not yet, uh, do not have enough data to say, but they might also have a functional meaning. That is, that the air that is trapped inside these incisions might help in the rising of the leavened bread when it is being baked. Um, then the next question, why do we have bread molds in the 7th millennium BC and then we don't have them anymore? Uh, we think we might simply not be seeing them, but they might be there. Um, they're just simple trays in a way, you know? And the uh, demonstration of this might be the fact that when we look at specific contexts, like uh, the case of the Palace of Mari in 1800 BC, so a very particular context, we do have uh, molds that, of course, are very special because they are for the king's table. Uh, the kitchen area of the palace is this one. It is made of different rooms. In one room we have the tandirs, tenuru, for the unleavened bread, and then there's another room with a domed oven. Next to this room, the molds have been found uh, in, some, in a quite a quantity. It's 49 molds. We do not know if they were all used for bread, but certainly the presence of these vessels do suggest that, uh, as I was saying, we might have uh, vessels of such a function. I'm finished. So to conclude, uh, oh, just one thing to be said. Uh, you have seen that a bread uh, of different kinds, leavened, unleavened, can be produced uh, within the same recipe. It can be produced, of course, within the same house. So for example, here you have today, same house, leavened bread and unleavened bread being baked with different uh, farming facilities. Um, okay, in conclusion, uh, I believe we have opened many questions, maybe we haven't answered so many, but uh, for sure we can say that uh, at least uh, with the Natufian period, 12,000 BC, that is before domestication of cereals, we might be having the production of bread already that this bread can be leavened or unleavened. Um, that leavened bread was probably produced by the ceramic Neolithic period. We say this both on the basis of the double balance, but more specifically on the presence, on the basis of the presence of the bread molds. Um, and that around possibly 3300 BC, but surely from the beginning of the early Bronze Age, around 3000 BC, we have a specialization in the production of unleavened bread with the um, first uh, invention and production of the tandirs tin noodles.